Uh, so, hello, uh, my name is Stefan Wenk, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about soccer supporters. Uh, soccer supporter groups are unlike anything found in any other American sport. Uh, they're a growing phenomenon of sports culture here in the United States, with over 120 groups across, across the country, ranging in size from under 50 members to over 1,000. My Keystone project analyzes the experiences and practices of supporters through the lens of anthropological literature on ritual, religion, and magic. Uh, but before we dive into that, first, a little background. What is a supporter? A supporter is a word used to describe a specific type of fan uh, of a sports team, typically soccer fans. And the key difference between supporters and fans is that supporters are active participants in sports, while fans are consumers and spectators. Supporters are often members of supporter groups, which are independent from the teams they support and led by volunteer work from supporters. These groups vary widely in size and usually have names that relate to the team they support, the place they're from, or who they are. Uh, some examples include True North Elite, with North serving as a regional identifier, the Midnight Riders, who support the New England Revolution and draw their name from Paul Revere's Midnight Ride, and the Red Loons, who pair their support of Minnesota United, known as the Loons, with Red to mark their left-wing political views. The distinction between supporters and fans is dependent on the level of participation, and participation can occur in a multitude of ways, both inside the stadium during matches and beyond the stadium during separate events. Being a participant beyond the stadium means getting involved in various supporter group activities, including social events like pre- and post-game tailgates, volunteering efforts like park cleanups pictured here, or working to coordinate donation or fundraising campaigns for local charitable organizations. It can also include volunteering in leadership with the supporter groups, designing or selling merchandise for supporter groups, and a lot more. One of my interlocutors during my research, Abe, explained why volunteering and community service are so important to supporter groups well. He told me that it's definitely a deep part of the culture uh, to make sure that you're gathering to make a difference in your neighborhood and that supporter groups are a social club that's organized for support of more than just sport, but also community. Many of my other interlocutors echoed the sentiment Abe expressed here, emphasizing the importance of collectivism within supporter groups to support their neighborhoods and communities, however those are defined. While within the stadium, most supporters occupy the supporters section and stand for the full duration of the match. Many supporter sections are actually standing room only for this exact reason. While they stand during the match, supporters spend most of the match to all of the match singing songs and screaming chants to will their team on to victory. These songs and chants are frequently led by drum lines to keep a steady beat going and supporters known as capos. The word capo comes from the Latin for head as these supporters stand at the front of the supporter section facing away from the field uh, to lead the crowd in chants. Another demonstration of support in the stadium is the raising of TIFO, which is pictured here on the right side of the screen. TIFO comes from the Italian word tifosi, which describes someone who is feverish, particularly as a result of typhoid fever, but was taken for use to describe the most passionate and feverish of fans. TIFO are these large banners painted on canvas to be raised at the start of a match by a pulley system operated by fans, and they stay up for around a minute prior to the match and then are lowered so they don't block the view of the spectators that are behind them. Alex, one of my interlocutors during my research, described the experience of being a capo and told me that it's something that people think is a cool thing to do but really, it's a huge sacrifice. When you're up there, you spend the whole time facing the wrong way, and you don't get to actually watch any of the game. Part of what first got me interested in pursuing this research was to try to understand why supporters committed so much of their time to supporter group activities, uh, like TIFO painting, or made sacrifices like being a capo during a match. Those sacrifices extend beyond the day of the match, too. I found this out firsthand as I began getting more involved as a supporter myself. In 2020, I began volunteering on the social media and marketing team of my supporter group. And in the summer, I found myself painting TIFO for a match I would never be able to attend. My research was conducted through a combination of my own participant observation as a supporter, I'll be very different during COVID, and interviews I conducted with supporters. I interviewed 20 supporters, mostly Minnesota United supporters, uh, with some others from around the United States as a sort of control group to ensure that my findings weren't too Minnesota specific. My interviews lasted roughly 45 to 60 minutes each, and I asked each supporter about their own experiences, opinions, and more about how they got involved as a supporter. My presentation is titled Magic in the Stadium, so you're probably wondering why I'm talking about magic. When you think of magic, you might think of a magician pulling a rabbit from a hat, or you might think of any number of characters from film, TV, or novels, like Gandalf here. But in anthropology, when we talk about magic, we're discussing a particular form of ritual. Marcel Mose, who wrote one of the seminal anthropological texts on magic, described magic as including a whole group of practices which seem to compare to those of religions, 
Um, and he believed that if there are any rights to, that are separate from religious rights, um, that they would be magical in nature. The criteria most laid out for magic are as follows. They typically have a strictly prescribed time and place. They may require specific tools and, and uh, they may require certain rites to be performed before or after the ritual. And perhaps most importantly, magic requires belief from the magician and from the audience. I believe that soccer supporters actually practice magic. And here's why. First, what is a stadium if not a specifically prescribed time and place for the actions of supporters that I discussed earlier? As for specific tools in soccer, scarves are perhaps the most common tool used, raised or waved for specific important moments. Other tools supporters make use of in their rituals within the stadium include drums, flags, and TIFO. Furthermore, in the case of Minnesota United, uh, Minnesota, where I'm from, uh, we can see specific rites that occur before and after the ritual of a soccer match. Before the, before the match, we see banners like TIFO raised and a specific song entitled Here We Go, Son. After the match, in the case of wins, it is tradition that Minnesota United supporters sing Wonderwall to celebrate victories and express gratitude towards the team. Additionally, most describe spells as a certain kind of magical rite, which are predominantly verbal in nature. They often take the form of incantations, which describe desired situations. Some examples of chants, or spells as I think of them, from supporters of Minnesota United can be seen here, uh, with Glory Glory Minnesota, sung to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, praising the team and describing a desire for Minnesota to be the greatest team that you will ever see, uh, although that has not always been the case. Vamos United, a song in Spanish, uh, shares a similar message with the final lines translating to, tonight we have to win. Earlier I mentioned that belief in magic is important. So this line of argument necessitates that I explore whether or not supporters believe in magic and why belief in magic is so important. According to most, rituals demand certain mental states and require that their participants have faith and belief in their power. It is this belief that gives a ritual its power. Both the belief of the magician and the belief of the onlooker are important. This is how entirely rational people can come to believe in magic and learn to see the world through a magical lens. Think about the superstitions you might have. Maybe you have a lucky pair of socks or something of this sort. The socks hold power for you because you believe they do. And when something good happens to you on the day you're wearing your lucky socks, you may choose to explain this occurrence as something having happened due to your socks rather than to other factors. Magicians and those who believe in magic choose to find magical justifications for events that occur rather than what others might view as more logical justifications. During the course of my research, I asked several supporters I interviewed whether they believe that supporters and their groups have an impact on the game being played. An overwhelming majority of supporters answered unequivocally that they did. The justifications they gave for this ranged widely, uh, with some pointing to specific anecdotes of their experiences and others identifying more scientific justifications like Bennett here, who told me that he knew that they did, statistically speaking, not like he knew in his heart, the numbers bear out that they do. Um, many justifications centered on the reactions that their actions generated in players like these. Above all else though, <clears throat> it, was <clears throat> it was clear to me from my interviews that supporters believed in the power that their actions, songs and chants had over players and the game. More specifically, they believed that this power originates from them, not as a prayer to a higher power as you might find in a religious ritual, but as a power in their own actions. Other main interlocutors, Nathan said that supporters can be the lifeblood the team feeds off of, and that they're cr a crucial part of the game. We can also see from their justifications that these supporters are still thinking rationally as they believe in magic. We often think, we often think that uh, you have to suspend rationality to engage in magical practice, but this is not truly the case. Marcel Mose wrote that magic is essentially the art of doing things and achieving through words and gestures or techniques achieved through labor. I believe that supporters are practicing magic in the stadium even if they do not realize it themselves. When I began this project, I did not expect to conclude that I and many other supporters believed in and practiced magic without even realizing it. What I learned is that rational people can believe in magic and that your day-to-day -day life may very well have magic in it that you believe in. I encourage you to examine your own lives in a magical way that you may not have considered before. I'd like to thank my interlocutors for their participation in this project. It wouldn't have been possible without them. And I'd also like to thank my advisor, Professor Joanna Davidson. Uh, thank you, and I'd like to open it up to any questions.